Welcome to this new online format of Talking Galleries. Thanks for joining us in this new series of panels about gallery practices and the art market. We want to understand the consequences of the pandemic in this industry and the digital challenges we are facing today. We expect our panelists to analyze the market's current situation and inspire and help us visualize where we are going in the next month. As I think Tang devoted to generating debate and knowledge, last week we had some very interesting sessions in Spanish and yesterday a vibrant session on digital solutions in the face of COVID-19. All these sessions will be uploaded on our website and will be accessible to everybody in a few days. I would like to thank all the panelists that are participating in these sessions and all the attendees that are joining us on this new format from home or the office. So, moving on to today's program, we have two panels. The first one will be on the future of our affairs post COVID-19. We are honored to have with us Mark Spiegler, Global Director of Art Basel Fairs, in conversation with Georgina Adam, art market author and journalist at Financial Times and the Art Newspaper. We had the privilege of having Mark participating in 2015 edition in Barcelona, also in conversation with Georgina. Their session, 10 questions every gallery should be asking themselves now, is the most viewed session in the history of Talking Galleries, with almost 20,000 views. I highly recommend you watching it if you have not done so. After that, we will have a second session on the art market What Next with Anders Peterson, founder and managing director of Art Tactic. I hope you all find the sessions interesting and profitable. Georgina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. And thank you for Mark. I'm really honored and privileged to be here to talk to you again. Everyone remembers that session back in 2015. Uh, which, as Lucien said, was called 10 questions every gallerist should be asking themselves now. So, as you can imagine, 2015, 2020, we're in a very different world. As director of the Art Basel Group, I've got 10 questions to ask you about this new world that you're facing, how you've coped with it, how you see the future of art fairs. So my first two questions we'll go over quite quickly because we sort of know already that you had to cancel all three live art Basel fairs uh, in Hong Kong, in Basel, and now in Miami Beach. So my first question will be that. Can you just briefly run us through how you made those decisions, at what point you made them, what were the trigger points that made you make those decisions? Georgina, let me first say that it's really great to be here. I wish we were on stage in Barcelona like the last time. And I wish that the people who are watching us around the world were all, were all in the same room. And we will have time for your questions at the end, we hope. So, you know, feel free to hit me with those as well. Um, what does it mean to cancel a fair? What is the process? Um, it's a real, it's a concatenation of circumstances that comes into play, at, at least in, and as it has for us in this, in this year of COVID-19. Um, of course, you have the medical situation to keep in mind. You know, what's happening? How are things spreading? What are the reinfection rates, et cetera? But what we quickly learned already with the Hong Kong cancellation, which took place only five weeks before the fair would have taken place, um, was all the knock-on effects. You know, things you don't even think about, you know, like, our walls are built to some degree in Shenzhen, which is across the border with the People's Republic of China, which means that, that you don't know for sure if your walls are going to make it. You know, you don't know. In that case, we didn't know if workers would be allowed to come back from wherever they had gone for Chinese New Year's to finish building the walls. In the same way that the other walls that were coming from, from Switzerland, it wasn't clear if they were going to be able to, to land because, of course, as it should be, medicine and food were given priority in the port of Hong Kong, which had shut down extensively. You know, in the same way, quite rapidly, it became clear that flights from Northern Italy, from the US, et cetera, were not coming in. And, and so very, very quickly, you're thinking not just about what's going on, you know, with the disease itself, but what's happening and what does it mean? What are, what are the implications for society? We had a, a pretty surreal situation in Hong Kong where on the one hand, Schools and museums were closed. On the other hand, the Hong Kong Convention Center was not closed, you know. And so, you know, trying to read the tea leaves, um, trying to figure out what to do. And in this case, I have to say, in comparison, 
with the other two, especially because it was such a new thing with the Hong Kong show, I think just because of the timing of it. Um, there were really divided opinions at first. You know, there, there were people in Europe and in America who said, oh, you know, this, this Asian disease, we don't want to get anywhere close to it, little knowing that it would soon be in all of their own backyards. Mm. Um, you know, at the same time, there were people in Asia who said this was being exaggerated. And, and also, obviously, for the Asian galleries, not only, but especially for the Asian galleries, Art Basel Hong Kong has become such an important part of the year, such an important mm. part of the year of, of their economies, but also promoting their artists, meeting new collectors. Um, that at first there was, you know, we, we needed to make sure out of respect for the region and especially for Hong Kong, that we didn't cancel at a moment where it seemed like we were just giving up where we were being fair weather friends. So the process didn't take that long, but it was excruciating, you know, because you've basically got the whole world yelling at you to do different things. You know, and at mm. some point you have to just, gather your, your, your best counsel around you and make the call. Um, of course, it gets a little bit more complex if you work for a publicly traded corporation, which Art Basel is part of, the MCH group, which means that, that any such decision that you take has to be communicated in a very precise way and following a very precise series of steps. Um, but I imagine all of my you know, colleagues who run fairs have, run, have had a relatively similar process. You know, mm -hmm. this thing of, you know, first there's this, knowledge that oh we might have to cancel the fair and then you start talking to the galleries and you, get, you start getting very different opinions and then you know everyone says well, why didn't you cancel it three weeks ago and everyone says no that's crazy don't be afraid you know um you know i think it's just a, it's just a real test it's like i think it's sort of like being lashed to the mast in a storm you, you can't you can't dodge the issue and at some point you mm. just have to make a decision and then with basel 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 you yeah. then first of all it was moved to september right and then right finally you may recall that back in march and people were saying oh you know when the warm weather comes like the flu the flu season will be over and then you know um obviously that hasn't played out the way we expected it to but you know we when we made the decision in late march to postpone it to september everybody's or not, most people felt that that seemed reasonable, that, you know, we just push it back three months, we let the situation come under control. You know, it was right after the United States had shut its borders to Europe, um, you know, to protect itself, little knowing that eventually it would become the hotbed of the whole world in terms, in terms of the COVID-19. But, but um, it was, you know, that seemed like a long time, six months out. Mm. Um, mm. And of course, you know, by the time we had to make the, the decision in June, it was unclear and we still couldn't hold an event, you know, of this size without any restrictions. And, you know, again, you know, I think this, it was interesting though, um, because we'd been through a lot, you know, by that point, and we were also able to make the decision with much less time pressure than Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then of course, we also thought, well, by December, it should be okay. It would have, Clear yeah. through, and then we started seeing figures from Florida, which were terrible. Yeah. So, well, in, in general, the situation with the United States is very, very complex. You know, mm. Um, mm. Mm. it's very hard for people to go in and out of America to this day, and it probably will be through December. Um, you know, and regardless of where, you know, whether the fair was in New York or in Miami or in Los Angeles, you know it would have been hard to do. It wasn't a Florida specific thing, you know. Um, there are a few wrinkles like the fact that the Miami Beach Convention Center um, has been used uh, as a, has been used as, has been used the hospital. as a location. Yes. Well, it hasn't been used, I don't know if it's even been used as a hospital, but it's been set up as a backstop mm. in case the ICUs mm. overflow, which is completely reasonable. But you can't really ask people to ship art to a convention center that is currently set up as a backup hospital, you know. Mm. In the mm. middle of a pandemic mm. um mm. you know again i think it's you know i think in, but in every case we really held out hope and continued planning for as long as we could you know not only for the benefit of our own company but also because we know how important art fairs are normally in the economies of galleries mm. Mm. increasingly so so you've mentioned a couple of times mch and we have been reading in the press about a possible um uh majority shareholder who would be james murdoch one of the sons of rupert murdoch can you just fill me in on what the current situation is there yeah. 
So just a slight correction, he wouldn't be a majority shareholder, he'd be an anchor shareholder, which means he would have oh, okay. the largest, the largest stake. Majority would be right. over 50%. So um, okay. that's a deal which is which is we're working on. Um, there are still a few hurdles. Uh, you know, what it would mean basically is that we would have um, we would have an injection of new money, you know, in order to deal with uh, liquidity issues, which obviously have been um, have been exacerbated by the, the whole situation of not not just our boss not being able to do fairs, but the whole company not being able to do fairs, you know, including, mm -hmm. you know, the Basel World Fair, which would have been earlier this year. Um, you know, that's, you know, from from my perspective, and I've, I've said this, you know, publicly, and I've meant it every time I've said it, um, you know, I think it would be great uh, to have James Murdoch's group involved with the company, because I think they bring, they would bring to the group and, you know, to, to our Basel, um, a lot of knowledge and experience and networks within areas where we see potential growth, you know, connections to you know, Such as well, connections to media, connections, strong connections to technology. They have a strong involvement in um, in uh, environmental issues. You know, and so mm -hmm. I think it's there's a lot of the issues where they they are active as investors are, are areas where we see the potential for growth and certainly could benefit from their expertise. Um, how how could that is their interest? Because James Murdoch has a great interest in climate change and right. those sort of and of obviously an art fair which ships stuff around the world is possibly could improve matters a little bit how did you how do you see that working together there? well I mean, I think i mean every fair not just us faces this issue which is a bit you know fundamentally a fair is a very short-term event into which a lot of people fly in from all over the mm. world to which a lot mm. of a lot of material is shipped you know a lot of mm. work is shipped and generally they don't stay where they're shipped they then they get shipped somewhere else afterwards and you know i think um an alliance with somebody who's actively investing in new technologies built around sustainability would be helpful, you know, because obviously right. it's a very broad radar for what's going on in this space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you mention technology as well, in what way do you think that could be? There could be synergies there. Well, I mean, I think technology, I mean, one of the big pushes that we've done, you know, since we've started having to cancel fares is to really go, you know, much deeper into trying to do digital platforms as a way to sustain the market in this very difficult time. Yeah, well, you have given me the most perfect way of segging into the next question, which is obviously about your online viewing room, online viewing room 2020, which debuts tomorrow. Right. Um, so I would really like to know more about this. This is the first time that galleries are actually going to pay. Now, in the previous online viewing rooms, I think if you clicked on some of the galleries, you actually were sent back into that gallery's website. So is this going to be different? How is this going to work? And just tell me more about the take up you've had. Sure. Um, I mean, this uh, OVR 2020 builds upon the platforms that we built previously in order to, as a substitute in a sense, for the Hong Kong Fair and for the Basel Fair. And so those, those OVRs, online viewing rooms, ran in, um, those online viewing rooms ran in um, March and in June, um, and now um, this one uh, this one is a very different thing because it's not running in parallel to a fair. Um, it's limited to a hundred galleries, each of which are limited to six works. And unlike the you know the first two that we did were were very similar to fairs. We kind of used the fair metaphor or or you know um, setup. You know, so we ran we ran it for like 10 days. Um, this is much more focused and it's also focused on one year. I'm going to take one second because that ping noise you heard was my computer telling me that it's unplugged. So give me one second. <laughs> <laughs> OK, go ahead. Well, well, just while Mark goes and replugs in. OK, good. I'm back. Good, great. That was quick. Yes. Yes. OVRs. OVRs. So um, it's been a really interesting journey for us. It's a thing we talked about doing for a long time. And in fact, the original plan was to do the first one. We were going to do an OVR, you know, perhaps for Hong Kong, perhaps for Basel. As soon as we realized that we were going to do it for Hong Kong, we said that we, as soon as we realized rather that we were going to cancel the Hong Kong show, we said, hey, we have to do this. And I remember this moment where I was talking to Alvon Fisher, our digital director, and um, and we were saying, well, we were saying, well, you know, maybe we should do a kind of control group, a smaller. I said, no, we have to do it for every single gallery. Um, and you know, obviously, it's it's learning by doing, and there was experimentation. And um, you know, the first one, uh, the first the, the the first one was 
you know, pretty, not bare bones, but it was sort of, it was what we could get out as quickly, you know, within a very short time frame, even though we've been working on it for a long time. But when you accelerate production and you accelerate scale at the last moment, it obviously is not easy. Um, but we learned from that, you know, and, and you know, some, some, some. You can see come back in. Okay. And there he is. Wonderful. Right. <laughs> that, that's kind of my 20th at least Zoom call, and I don't know what happened. Anyway, that's that anyway. was. We were talking about the OVR. Sorry. OVRs, yes. yes. Um, so you were saying about what you learned in the first one. The first exactly. one, a little back, but exactly. so can this new one, OVR 2020, compared mm -hmm. to the earlier ones, what will we see that's different? So, what we learned in the from the first to the second one, from the Basel to, from Hong Kong to the Basel one, was that video is really important, and so we allowed galleries for every single artwork to upload a video of the artwork, you know, maybe a scrolling across the, the, the surface of a painting to show the impasto or these really cool, a lot of really great interviews with, with artists. Um, but I remember when we were discussing whether or not to do OVR 2020, because it wasn't a fait accompli that we would do it. You know, this is the thing that we could do or we could not do. Um, you know, that we were discussing doing. And then, you know, basically when I was talking to Alec Wagsdale about this from Listen, he said, you know, we need to turn it from a conversation, from a correspondence into a conversation. Because basically in the first two, if you were interested, you would say, make a sales inquiry and you would push a button and then it, it, the EP people would get an email. In this case, um, now for the OVR 2020, which they've used tomorrow, you can, the, the gallerist will have a, a video, will be able to project video out and you'll be able to chat with them in the same way that you can in this, in the same way that you can in this, uh, in this talk, you know? So for example, um, you know, this was really, this was, this was a, a thing that I think will be a, a next step. In other words, that in the first stage, you could see video of the works, but it's still not the same as, as a rapid interaction. And so I think mm -hmm. now for, you know, for, you know, for collectors to be able to say, who, you know, can you tell me more about this work? I'm interested. Is it available? Do you have more of the same? I think we'll be a little bit closer to the kind of, you know, real time interaction that happens in the fair booth. It's still not the same thing, but just mm -hmm. like this isn't you and this isn't you and I, you know, having sitting at a dinner table or in front of an audience, but it's still, I think, a real step forward. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, what's interesting is some people are going to stream artworks. Um, yes. Rick Ritter is going to is going to make artworks live on video during during the OVR. Um, mm -hmm. One gallerist who will remain unnamed because they may or may not follow through on this actually said, OK, well, how long is this? And I said, well, it's three and a half days. He said, well, OK, I'm going to stay on camera the whole time. So let's wow. see if someone let's see. Has this <laughs> kind of crazy endurance feat. But the point is that I think with each time that we do this, we learn more. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it's a little bit of a rough ride the first time out, you know, and, and you have your have ambitions and sometimes there are things you wanted to include, but you're not sure that it's going to work. You know, like this, this chat feature we thought about doing for Basel, but we weren't sure if it was stable enough yet. So mm -hmm. you know, now, now we're confident in it. Um, do you, how do you deal with the time difference? For example, I was watching the session yesterday and of course somebody like Agosian has somebody who can answer the, answer the phone, so to speak, uh, respond to the button all over the world, but not all galleries can do that. I think every gallery has its night owls. And it's, it's got a night, it's got yeah. a night owl, has it? There are night owls out there. No, I mean, I don't know, people are figuring it out. And also, I mean, some people will just say, these are our opening hours. You know, I think there's yeah. no, it's right. not a requirement that you staff it 24 hours a day, but right. there's a value to that. And, and the other thing is that I think many galleries have people who are living in different parts of the world at the moment, you know? So, um, yeah, the, what was interesting is, you know, we, the, also the, the time frame, you know, for the OVR 2020 was extreme. You know, we announced it, if I remember correctly, about a month ago, you know, people had a couple of weeks to pull projects together. The deadline was on the Wednesday, the selection procedure was on the Thursday and we announced the galleries on a Friday and we had about 50% more applications than we actually had rooms for. Cause we had said specifically, it's going to be a hundred booths. Mm. You know, so we couldn't do 106, you know, and mm. my fear was what if only 70 people apply, but fortunately that wasn't the case. You know, it was, I was off by a factor of, of two on that. Mm. Um, 
And it's really, really interesting. I mean, I think what's, you know, what's really fascinating is you have very young artists, you know, people like Ben Eichmann, Eichmann's from, from Carlos Ishigawa, you know, um, you know, you have people like Ryan Gand, who I think are very well established, you know, from their generation. And you have people who've been working who have very, very long careers, like Gabriel Orozco or Rick Ritter-Venige, or even Gunter Ucker, who I believe is 101, you know. Um, wow. So it's new work, but it's it's not just by youngsters. I think that's important. And I think most of the work, in some way or another, reflects the year in which it was made, which was this very surreal year. And I think whether it reflects the specifics of the pandemic, the loneliness, the isolation, the fear, you know, um, or whether it's it's more specific to some of the racial issues that have arisen in the United States and other mm. places, I think this is this is a, a it's kind of a, an interesting aesthetic and philosophic transaction of what's been going on in the studios of artists worldwide. Um, one thing I don't know to what extent you can tell me, but do you have some sort of a handle on the value of works of art that were offered in your previous OVRs and what will be offered? I mean, yesterday that we were talking about the Gagosian Olin work that were, that was asking six million dollars that sold through the yeah. OVR. So, do you have? Can you steer us a bit on that? So the first the first OVR, the the Hong Kong one, the total value of the work that was offered was roughly two hundred and fifty million dollars, mm -hmm. which is pretty significant, you know, for an online platform. Um, but then the Basel one, uh, the total value of the work offered, you know, at some stage during those 10 days was over a billion dollars. Wow. Um, you know, so that's that's like a pretty solid uh, yeah. auction week, for example. Yeah. You know, I mean, yes. not Absolutely. everything sold, but a billion dollars mm -hmm. worth of art. And that's by no means the best or the only measure of work, of artworks. Mm -hmm. Still, no. I think. I think but you're a commercial fair. About yeah. what people are willing to commit, not only willing to commit for a sale, but commit with a price or a price range on it, you know, because that's one of the interesting things about the OBRs. And we introduced that from the beginning with the Hong Kong show is that we said every work has to have a price or a price range on it. And I can, can't tell you how incredibly valued that has been by collectors, you know, because it, it takes and we debated that, you know, we discussed it with our committees who are our advisors, not just in terms of who we choose, but also, um, how we work with galleries and, and they said you know there are some artists who won't work that but work with that but if it's a price range then that's acceptable so the range is okay it may not be the exact price yeah exactly. that's, yeah. yes but all i mean i've heard so many talks about people like artsy they always say that it's an incentive to buy if you put the price on a work of art that well, seems I mean, to be i will 100 percent cite my my friend and former colleague alexander forbes who wrote an essay specifically about this which I showed to our committees and said, listen, Artsy says, I don't remember the exact number, it's something like if a work has a price on it, it's six times more likely to sell. Exactly, yeah. And six yeah. times more likely to sell is exactly what you want in this period. Mm, so absolutely. I think that's the moment where, I mean, we don't have a lot of data, but when you have that kind of data, you have to act on it. Mm. So actually, this is there again, very segs very night, neatly into my next question, which is um, the, the UBS report, uh, the UBS Basel report, said that galleries only made 16% of turnover via, via online fairs, so not only yours, compared to the physical uh, galleries, which was 46%. I mean, that's obviously an average. Um, so obviously now you need to encourage, you know, what can your OVRs and what can your online initiatives do to help galleries get back up to that level of sales that they used to make? I mean, the short answer to your question is, is we will never be able to achieve online the power that you have when you have a fair, when you have, and I'm just, I'm looking out the window at the, the clock, the iconic clock on the front of the Mesa Basel halls, the one that, you know, on a, normally on a Tuesday in June, you would have thousands of people masked in front of, eager to buy, or even pretending mm -hmm. they're not going to buy something because of their budget. And we know damn well, they're going to go in and buy things, you know. Um, but the point is, there's a kind of um, good contagious power that happens in that kind of crowd. You know, Elias Canetti wrote an amazing book called Crowds and Power, and he talks about how individuals sort of turn into a sort of mass organism, you know, and I think this is what happens at an art fair. Collectors see other collectors buying, collectors get competitive, collectors kind of enable each other. Um, they see work, they meet gallerists, they meet artists, and 
you can do parts of that online, but it's not going to have the power of seeing a work, a great work, meeting a gallerist, seeing other collectors buying it. You know, um, you know, I remember in previous tough economic times, collectors coming to Basel with the notion that they were going to get 40% off. And the gallerist just holding the line for half an hour, and the collector who asked for 40% and got denied, going to the next booth and getting denied again, and then saying, you know what, actually I'm going to have to pay proper prices. And that's the kind of thing you can't replicate. But long story short, this is a time when we don't have the pleasure, the luxury of traveling the world and seeing lots of art. Um, fairs are very difficult to achieve at any sort of scale, and certainly international fairs are, are very difficult at the moment. Um, and so what this period is, I think, is, is a forced moment of development and experimentation on the digital front. And the great thing is that these are not band-aids. These are moments when people will develop new skill. People will learn to do a great studio tour via Zoom. Mm. People will learn how to use video, not just the video we're using now, but also the still videos. People will learn how to get people excited. If you talk to collectors, but get excited digitally, you know, and, and that will continue because for example, you know, one of the things that we did that we saw other, we saw galleries doing is then started doing ourselves between the Hong Kong fair and the Basel fair was these VIP walkthroughs where basically you gather people in a room and then a series of gallerists talks about the work that's in their online viewing rooms and takes questions and all that kind of thing. And so, we're doing that now. We're doing several dozen of them, for example, for OVR 2020 in the space of three and a half days, you know, and some of them are themed and some of them are geographic themes and some of them are, are aesthetic themes. Um, and some of those are specific groups of, for specific groups of collectors from specific countries. But the point is, when we start doing fairs again, that will still be a valuable tool because for every fair, no matter how important, there are still people who can't make it. And why shouldn't a gallerist stay after work in their booth or before, I mean, after the fair hours or before the fair hours and do a walkthrough for collectors. You know, if, if, if you're in the Basel fair, why not do a, a walkthrough for your Taiwanese collectors who couldn't make it at 10 in the morning from Basel? Or why not stay a little bit late and do a walkthrough for your collectors in Mexico City or Peru yeah. or yeah. the West Coast mm. who can't make it? So that, so in a sense, there will be even going forward, maybe some yeah. sort of a hybrid. And in fact, going forward, uh, that report that I mentioned, the UBS Art Basel report, also cast some doubt on the future of fairs next year. I mean, our topic is the future of art fairs. Tell us about Hong Kong next year. I mean, we are we are moving what, forward. What is we're the, moving forward with the selection for the Hong Kong show. Right, um, yes. Obviously, we're, we're doing our research about what, what measures might, we might need to take. Um, but I think in that sense, we're, again, you know, our, our modus operandi is not stealth mode, our modus operandi, our modus lavori, the way in which we work right now is to keep pushing to do shows as long as possible and to operate under the assumption that if we don't work on the show, it's definitely not happening. And so if we have, if we want the show to happen, we have to work on it. And obviously you have to monitor the situations, but I mean, our, you know, our intention is to do the Hong Kong show in March. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's probably the intention of, you know, I assume that my colleagues in, you know, in Madrid are looking to do ARCO in February. You know? Yeah, I was going to ask you that because obviously you talk to other fair directors. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, yours obviously is, is the sort of the main group, but there are many others who are also impacted. Yeah. Is everyone thinking the way you're thinking, um, hoping to go ahead, watching the situation? <clears throat> I mean... Uh, to be honest, with you, I've been I've I have spoken with some of my fellow fair directors, um, but mostly I've been talking to gallerists because I think mm. fundamentally that's the core of what we do, you know, and getting a sense from them <clears throat> about how they feel. And I think um, when I when I was a political writer before I was an art journalist before we were colleagues, um, uh, you know. We used to say where you stand depends on where you sit. And I think where you stand right now about the future depends a lot on where you sit. You know, if you're in a country that's in free fall with a government that's doing nothing to stop that and, you know, economically isn't providing support and you're on lockdown 
<clears throat> your collectors are moving to the country or leaving or leaving the name the country altogether you know they're moving the countryside leaving the country it's a very different world than if you're in berlin and you've just had gallery weekend which i went to as my first business trip in six months and you saw people coming you saw hundreds of people coming to the galleries you saw people buying works you know there were great shows at gallery weekend berlin i mean really mm. from a quality standpoint perhaps the best in years, definitely the best in years you know mm. and there was a and there were the, the German collectors showed up and then, you know, there were some internationals who came as well, you know, you know, a few dozen heavy hitters and then a lot of other people as well. And I think, I think people are getting moving again in some parts of the world. Mm, you know? mm. um, I'm, I'm hoping if borders don't close to go to Italy next week and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm assuming I'll find a very different spirit there than I might if I went to New York city, you know, mm. um, so so the, the, talking about your fair and other fairs going forward will we see i mean uh, is it the sort of concentration say of more local galleries you said that berlin there were a lot of people came but obviously americans to a large extent can't travel so they're not going to do you think that we'll see fairs that are more concentrated on their local community in the sense that you'll have more local galleries and more local collectors as well or people not coming from very far <coughs> I mean, that only works to some degree. I think what we're seeing is a lot of galleries who are, I spoke to several gallerists in Berlin who said, I've never driven so much as in the past six months because they're driving to see their, their their collectors in Cologne and in Munich mm. and in Frankfurt and in Hamburg. Um, um, but I think, I think, let's face it, what makes fair powerful is that it brings people from all over the world together. Yeah. Before COVID-19, the big debate was whether any of the mid-level fairs would survive or whether there would be consolidation in which, you know, the, the top level fairs like Fries and FIAC and the Basel fairs, of course, and Tefaf, the Tefaf fairs were going to sort of be the fairs that everybody went to. Um, you know, and I think, I think the, I'm not sure that a local fair is the thing that the galleries need. I think local activities is what the galleries need. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you're in Berlin, which has an amazing market, you know, from the haute bourgeoisie, obviously, to the to the aristocracy, you know, if you've got a very, very deep market and a great number of galleries, yeah, you can do that. But, for example, there isn't an art fair in Berlin, you know, for those galleries right now, this gallery, mm -hmm. just perfectly suited, you know. Um, you know, would it make sense to do a version of FIAC with just the French galleries? I mean, it's the Foire Internationale d'Art mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. national. It's not the FNAC, yes. it's the FIAC. And I think that's a very different thing, you know? So um, I think in this period where major international affairs are difficult, galleries will probably use, you know, try to, to mine their local markets more, deepen their local connections, you know? And, and the reality is that I think a lot of galleries in Berlin are realizing there's actually a pretty strong tech scene with some people who have money and are young and, and guess what? Are not traveling either. So now they finally have time to discover, mm. discover the galleries in their hometown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. But it's curious because what you said to me, in a way, you said two different things. You said it's necessary to have that international reach, but at the same time, at the moment, Berlin shows that it's all that that it's been quite German centric in a sense. Berlin Gallery. Week. Sure, but I mean, I don't think anybody like you can't talk to a gallerist, Gallery Weekend, who thinks this was from a sales perspective a better weekend than it would have right. been if the borders were open. I mean, okay. it, it's a great, I mean, I think we have to keep things in perspective. And this is a generally for all of us, you know, we went very quickly from fifth gear into neutral. Yeah. We're not going to go back into fifth gear overnight. Right. You know, this is going to mm. be a process mm. of steps forward and steps back. It's going to be, you know, trials. It's going to be, let's face it, you know, not everybody is ready to get on a plane and go to Berlin, you know, and wear a mask in the galleries and go to dinners and all this kind of thing. And I think it's, it's um it's going to be a process it's going to be a rebuilding process it's you know it's mm -hmm. like when the champion team you know in sports has a few people retired a few people get injured and suddenly they have to start again and, and it's a different it's building a different team and we're, mm -hmm. we're not going to return to the old normal you know and eventually yeah. the new normal but it's going to be new before it's normal you know and i think <laughs> that's that's the process that we're in mm -hmm. we're, we're actually in trying to rebuild something which which is like the art world that we had before, you know, for us, you know, I think of Art Basel as a platform for patronage for artists. And but it's clear that 
what we build in the future is going to be not only fares, but also that it's going to have a very strong hybrid quality. And the digital, yeah. the digital platforms that we've developed, the digital skills that our, our galleries have developed and the artists have developed, the digital habits and, and you know, let's say, and, and um, the digital, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the ease with which collectors are, are doing things digitally, they never did, did it before. Mm -hmm. I think is going to create a new market. And that's that's sort of my, my optimistic view, you know. Mm. Um, so another question that I wanted to ask you, um, where is your competition coming from now? So we were talking about uh, Berlin Gallery Weekend. Are Gallery Weekends possibly more competition? Are they going to be strengthened by this? We had a discussion before the, before we had this actual conversation now, and you gave me a very good answer, which was competition is. Uh, Do you remember what you told me? Oh, yes, I said, I said that I think the competition is, is the virus, you know. In exactly. Sense. You know, I exactly. think everyone is competing with, you know, and we're all, mm. we're all fighting the same fight. But to give another answer, because I reserve the right to change my mind, you know, <laughs> um, you know, Someone asked me the same question, actually. There was a journalist who put forward the notion when I was at a dinner in Berlin um, with Tilo Verne from Gallery Neu. It was, it was nice. It was, it was weird, but it was nice to be at a dinner at the Grill Royale where I've had so many dinners for so many years, over so many years, with many of the same people who I'd seen before um, for all those years, people I've known for 15 or 20 years. And I was sitting with Tilo, and there was a, a journalist opposite me who put forward this notion, you know, art fairs are done, gallery weekends are, are how, and, and Tilo said, and he, he, Tilo didn't even give me a chance to give a sort of polite rebuttal. Tilo said, that's not at all how it works. Like he said, this is great, it's wonderful, but nothing will compare with what happens in Basel on that opening day when all the people, including those who said, I have no money, I'm on a budget, I'm not buying anything, come in and, you know, start buying, you know, like they've never seen art before. They just like the one, they just won the lottery. I think there's, there's, again, there's that, that power. And, and I mean, I would actually make the counter argument, you know, if anything, whatever you thought of this notion of fair teague, which I always hated as a word and, and also never believed, this is a moment where people are actually really ready to go back to art fairs, where people actually look forward to seeing people from all over the world. They actually look forward to trying to see a hundred galleries with a hangover and jet lag, you know, and, and I think, you know, I think, and, and obviously I'm not speaking for everybody, but I do think we really miss each other. It's one of the reasons why, you know, we at Art Basel started doing these Zoom panels on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and just reconnecting the art world with mm. each other, and, you know, mm. people on screen and, and hearing people's pain and hearing people's strategies and hearing people's experience and what they've lived, because normally that's a thing that we do when we go to biennials or fairs. That's a thing. That's when we, that's when we touch base with each other, and that's what's mm. not happening. And I think, mm. you know, it's a very different thing. And I, I also Germany is exceptional in terms of the depth of its collectors and the depth of galleries you have in a place like Berlin. New York, you could have a similar thing, although New York is is not in the place for that right now. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so, well, they're all in the Hamptons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even yeah. You know, I think for me what drove it home, and maybe I say that because I'm a parent, but like for me, when I heard that people hadn't just, weren't just summering in the Hamptons 100%, but were actually moving their kids out to schools in the Hamptons, I said, oh, okay, this is this is real. Like, mm. like the, low, the Upper East Side is gonna be a very different thing until there's a vaccine, you know, mm. and that really people are moving their lives to mm. other places. And of course, gallerists, as always, move where the collectors are and so you have these kinds of pop-ups and i haven't been there but noah horowitz my you know my colleague who runs who's our director america said it's it's funny because it's almost like an art fair because these are not huge these are not huge galleries you know done by modernist architects they're basically the space you can find in the hamptons in the middle of august but people are there and they're selling art because that's where the collectors are i think i, went, I don't remember the topic or the, the question so you'll have to <laughs> I wanted to ask you about digitization. We've mm -hmm. talked an enormous amount about technology, about OVRs, about all of this. But do you think that there's a danger that it could sort of cannibalize the actual physical space? Uh, do you think there's a danger there? I don't think so. Um, you know, because that's a fear that 
was sort of embedded in Art Basel as an organization when I arrived. You know, when I arrived here, actually, literally, I'm sitting in the conference room that was my temporary office in 2007 when I first came here. Um, and sitting in this room, you know, I realized that that what had been developed was that a, it sounds crazy now. A week after the fair, Artnet, which was our partner at the time with this, would put a map a map of the fair online. And you could click there and see artworks that had been shown at the fair, but only for a month. And then they disappeared mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. people were afraid that if you put it online, nobody would come. But the reality is this, like we now have tens of thousands of works that are in our online catalog. This is before we even started doing OVRs and that never stopped people from coming in the same way that making music available online doesn't mean people don't, don't go to concert. It actually means that people discover music musicians, and are more likely to go to concerts. You know, mm. um, a friend of mine, a, my, my friend Ty Ma Taylor, who's been in tech forever, says, you know, content wants to be promiscuous. I think when you, when you spread content, when you spread art, when you make it more available, it excites people. And I'll, I'll you know, I remember um, Arif Suharan from Jakarta who is an Indonesian collector. And because of where he lives, and because he's a busy guy running his family's film business, which can you imagine, as you can imagine running cinemas in Indonesia is a pretty, keeps you pretty busy. Mm -hmm. He's an active collector, but most of what he collects, he collects at a distance. And he said for him, it's never been a better time to be a collector, you know, at a distance because suddenly galleries actually are eager mm -hmm. to reach you because they don't have people coming into the gallery, you know? And so mm -hmm. they're actually thinking about, you know, how can I do, how can I make my artists available digitally? How can I do things that are actually Exciting. So, so in essence, um, I've never believed that technology is a danger for fairs because I, I fundamentally believe. Well, I think it was more a danger for physical spaces. For for in, you know, the, that, in the same way, I mean, first of all, very few artists get excited about the notion of producing twenty paintings that go into a series of thumbnails. Yeah. And they want it to be seen. You know, that's exactly. Yes still have galleries in part because artists want their work to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, uh, and again, I think, you know, Instagram for all its flaws, you know, like I see shows on people's feeds and then I want to go see them in the same way that a lot of people who weren't to Gallery Weekend Berlin, because I'm a pretty, um, a pretty avid and thorough poster of the, of the shows that I see, people saw the 50 shows, they saw images from the 50 shows that I saw on the exhibitions and stuff. And so, they have an idea of what's in Berlin and maybe they'll go to Berlin, you know, mm. and I think it's in the same way. I think I don't, you know, if, if we were selling widgets or, you know, if we were, you know, like you can't digitize the experience of art the same way you can digitize the experience of music. Mm. It's not mm. the same thing to have something mm. on the screen or to have something in front of you, you know, mm. um, what's important though is that every generation understands that that every generation, if you have a generation like we have now with music that's never heard vinyl mm -hmm. played on a really great, you know, high fidelity sound system, they don't know the difference between the, the, the sort of the honey warmth of that music and like the tinny coldness of the MP3s they're playing on their phone. But mm -hmm. I don't think people will stop being exposed to art. And as long as they are, then the digital only serves as a catalyst to make them see more art. Mm. History might prove me wrong, but that's what I believe <laughs> on. It's based on 13 years of experience at our mm. So we're coming to my last two questions. Okay. Um, so the number nine would be, what are the lessons that you've learned uh, from leadership through this extremely grueling period? It has to be admitted that you've been through. Yeah. I mean, I think, and here I'm going to talk about things which aren't specific to the art world. You know, I think there was a, there was a moment and it was a process um, where we sent a letter to our exhibitors. Um, and as always, I run it past many people on my team just in a draft form. And I remember I wrote this letter um, and I had just watched a really great um, video about leadership during this period um, that, that was done by Wharton, you know, uh, the Wharton School of Business in Pennsylvania. Um, and it said the three skills that you need to lead in this period are empathy, transparency, and humility. You know, and I thought about that as I wrote this letter. And I wrote a letter that was unlike any letter that we'd ever put out before. 
Um, not in terms of empathy, because I think we've been very clear about the fact that we knew how hard it was for the galleries. But I think what we did there, instead of doing what we're known for, which is to try to be precise and accurate and self-confident in our assessment, was to just lay it on the table and said, we don't know. Yeah. We don't know when a vaccine will come. We don't know when the therapy will come or a medical therapy will come. We don't know what the travel restrictions will be. We don't know when people will start traveling to collect again and in to what degree they will. Mm. No. And so, and pe some people were shocked by it. I mean, including some people in my team at first, I really like to say, the tone is what I want. Let's talk about the, the language, you know? Um, and, um, and, you know, I myself had to, as the Germans say, I had to jump over my shadow to write that letter, but it, it felt, in the end, it felt good. And people really appreciated the fact that we just said, we don't know. And, mm -hmm. and we said, this is what we're thinking about. So you know what we're thinking about. But, yeah. I, you know, um, if you can compare sort of how Cuomo and Trump have handled this, I think, you know, Cuomo has been out there saying, you know, these are the numbers. These are the facts. This is what we don't know. This is what we hope to achieve. This is where we could have done better. And I think um, this is a, I think in general, everyone is expecting leaders to be more humble, more transparent. You know, um, I think this kind of, you know, alpha male command and control version of leadership is totally outdated. But as with everything else related to this pandemic, you know, a process that might have taken 20 years took two months. And suddenly yeah. the expectation was that if you're a market leader, especially if you're a market leader, you're going to do what's right and you're going to evaluate things in the right way and you're going to try to listen to your market. And of course, there are always people who feel like they weren't heard or you made the wrong decision and that's okay. It comes with the territory. But I think I think to, to step into a different mode of thinking, you know, and also, in, you know, frankly, you know, I run one of the leading organizations in the world for what we do. And we've do achieved that by being precise and thinking ahead and making contingency plans. And, you know, suddenly we're in this situation where it doesn't make sense to think too far ahead. I think, you know, I think it, and normally what we would do, which I think is what most people do, is you have sort of what are the three most like, likely scenarios? What's the best scenario? What's the worst scenario? What's in between? How do we mitigate for the worst and how do we try to achieve the best and how do we live with the in-between? Now, you know, you have 10 scenarios and you don't know which one of, you know half of them will be irrelevant in two weeks, but you don't know which half. So basically, yeah. I just had a meeting with my, with my team, you know, where, where I said, okay, this is great, but now stop working. Because unless we know what's, where we're going to be three months from now, there's no point in investing yeah. time. Let's just, we, yeah. we've done everything we can. We've thought things through. We understand the dependencies. We understand the options. That's it. We should take questions soon. I'm really, I'm, I'm really bad. I'm absolutely going to. I did, I, in fact, I've got some questions in front of me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read you one or two of them. Uh, from Sabrina Amrani, is Art Basel taking the opportunity to reach or create a new community, a digital generation? And if so, how? Um, first of all, hi, Sabrina. I hope things are good <laughs> in, in Madrid or wherever you may be at the moment. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I think by definition, when you when you go into a more digital mode, you reach a different generation, although not only, you know, I think the notion that only the young are online is, you know, is, is quickly laid to rest by people like my mother who at 82 is still WhatsApping me, you know, pretty consistently, <laughs> you know, but but no, I think by definition, you know, if you look at, at the report, the latest reports that we've done with, with UBS, you know, the, the Art Basel UBS Art Market Report, you see that obviously, not surprisingly, millennials are more likely to collect online, they're more likely to do research online, they're more likely to buy via Instagram, et cetera. Um, and I think it is important, but I also think, you know, in, in a sense, you know, our first loyalty is to the, to the art world that we know and to try to, you know, to contrib contribute in whatever what we way and in, in whatever way we can to the cohesion, to the, you know, to the support of that art world. Um, but of course, by definition, you know, there are more than 3 million social media accounts that follow us on one or one or more channels, you know? So um, by definition, that's not the art world as we know it, which is relatively small. It's a whole other group of people who may have a passing interest or may have an increasingly passionate interest um, in, in what we're doing. And so I think in, in, in essence, you know, um, you know, if you see the, the video we just posted online promoting the OVR 2020, it's a completely different vibe 
than what we've done in the past. You don't have me talking about, you know, welcome to the fair, et cetera. It's, it's really like, it's focused on the works. It's really, it's, it's sort of a quick cutting. And I think obviously it's, it's trying for a much more contemporary kind of feel than we might do if we were doing something. Obviously it'll be a different thing when we do the 21st century, the 20th century. Mm. So Annabel Roque Rodriguez, what new metrics for success do art fairs need to incorporate in the future? if visitor numbers are not going to go back to pre-COVID and sales levels? Well, I mean, I think visitor numbers, visitor numbers were never that important to us. I think what's really important to us. I mean, honestly, I think the metric for success that we always use, that we always held paramount, was the number of galleries who reapplied. Because if a gallery reapplies, it means that in one way or another, you're serving their interests in the same way that, that magazines focus not on newsstand sales, but on, on resubscriptions, you know, that means yeah. you're serving your client, you know, and I think yeah. if galleries are, you know, if obviously we're going to shift around things, but I think, you know, for us, what's going to be really important is that one way or another, whether it's digitally or physically or ideally both, the galleries that are coming to our fairs feel like we're serving them in terms of them building patients around the program in terms of meeting new collectors in terms of activating collectors they might have worked with before. And so I think in that sense, it's not the the metrics that change, you know, the, the key performance indicator is not different. It's really a question of how do we achieve that? What does it take when we, you know, in this new normal to achieve what we've always tried to achieve, which is to bring great collectors from all over the world to great galleries from all over, all over the world in support of great artists all over the world. So Antonia Carver, hello Antonia. Hi Antonia. I, <laughs> I get digital art being seen and bought on digital platforms, but do we really want to normalize the experiencing and buying of works on a digital platform that were created for the physical world? To an extent, I think you've answered that one when we talked about yeah. uh, potential cannibalization. Do you want to say something more about that? I mean, I'm on the record in the FT no less as saying that, that an Amazon world is, is terrifying. It's like a dystopia to me. An Amazon art world is, is a dystopia mm. to me. I, I don't think that's the way that art should be appreciated. You know, um, again, I think in a hybrid environment, it's totally fine. I, I think mm. people only buy art online are missing something. And they're, and, and they're really kind of cheating themselves of the chance to meet artists, to meet gallerists, to see work in person, to, to I mean, I. I mean, I, I don't buy art because of the conflict of interest issues, but but I certainly would not buy art only online. Um, mm. Mm. Uh, Alain Sauvé, hello Alain. Hi Alain. Uh, how about the political situation in Hong Kong? Yeah. I mean, the political situation in Hong Kong is, is, is interesting. I think we have to see how it develops over time, you know. Um, at the moment, things are calmer than they were, but obviously it's because the situation is different. And I think we'll, you know, um, as I said before, we're pushing forward with the, you know, with plans for the 2021 show. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we we haven't had a history of censorship, you know, um, in Hong Kong at the fair, and we're hoping that continues. Um, I'm sorry, this is a difficult name to Anna Sapindika Dai. Could you discuss on the lack, on, on the, in brackets, lack of 3D works, display functions and features. It's definitely tricky to include that. So wondering about any public facing larger scale solution. So the problem of 3D work installations and so on. In, in, I mean, I guess she means in the OVR format. I mean, I think- I guess, yes, I'm sure that it is, yes. Um, I mean, obviously we've been approached a million times by people who offer, want to offer us VR solutions or that kind of thing. But I mean, as an intermediate step and one that every gallery can easily do, um, allowing people to upload a video around about every work um, is, has, was already valuable. And then for example, um, uh, you know, there was one gallery, I think I can say it, Salon 94, you know, um, uh, Fabienne from Salon 94 told me they sold a Nikki Desnafal sculpture to a collector who'd never seen it and who they'd never met before because they had the video. And obviously, you know, if you do this intelligently, um, it, it can it can already give people a sense of the you know of the materiality and, and especially of the dimensions. Of course, a lot of galleries are experimenting with apps where you can sort of take a sculpture that they're having on offer and drop it in your garden or drop it in your mm. living. Mm. And that's another thing. Again, I'm not. I mean, obviously, it's not the same as buying of, of seeing a work before you buy it. Um, you know, but I think 
I think, you know, again, if it's, you know, it really depends on the conditions. If it's an artist, you know, if it's a series of work that you know, if you know the basic materiality, if you've seen it, and just a question like what's the shape and dimensions, then online works. Um, I think to try to introduce someone to an entirely new artist, even using VR, would not, does, doesn't fit my notion of how people appreciate sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie Ramos, hello Leslie. From a visitor point of view, how has your experience of being back in a physical gallery weekend, for example, Berlin, post-COVID? I think to an extent we, you've talked about that and how successful it was for you. I mean, I'll, I guess the, I'm going to take the question as personal, but I'll keep it short. It felt amazing. I mean, and, and I had the privilege of doing, of being involved um, in three events in a row. There was the gallery weekend Berlin, the week before last, and then, and then right at the end of that, I came to this. I came back to Zurich Art Weekend, um, and then after you know, we just finished on Sunday the Kunsttage Basel, which where forty four different organizations, galleries, museums, etc., did exhibitions, and the whole city came out. And I, I just it. Um, all I can say is, is you know, if you've been in lockdown, if you haven't been going to shows, you know, when the moment comes, not only to see work in person en masse, but also to see the art world again, to see your friends, mm -hmm. see people mm -hmm. who you've only been texting with or, you know, maybe Zooming with. Um, it's just amazing. You know, I think it's, it's, uh, it was, it's, it's just, um, I mean, I don't want to say it's like being released from prison, but it, it, it you know, you feel how much you, you own, own, I think I'll say this, only when you go back into galleries and seeing lots of shows and seeing lots of people, Will you realize how hard this period has mm. been for you as someone mm. who was art? Mm. Um, there's a question as well from, well, there's so many questions. I'm not going to be able to take them all, unfortunately. Well, never. Um, <laughs> Andrea Antonoli, how would Art Basel use of all the new data they have from online collectors? How would Art Basel use all the new data they have from online collectors? Do you actually have the that data? We have data, but we only use it in a in large scale anonymized way. I mean, we use it basically to improve the platforms every time. You know, we, we see mm. what's working, and what's not working, you know, how long people are staying on, so, on certain galleries, which, ga which kind of material works best. Um, I mean, I think like everybody, well, I mean, everybody uses data, you know, some people, you know, more in a more predatory way than others, you know, what we mm. use it for is to improve the, the site, you know, on behalf of the galleries and the users. Mm -hmm. Well, I could see that talking galleries, I think Lucy I is going to come back in. So I feel like we're me, about to hold off stage. I would Maybe. like to thank you so much, uh, Mark. Thank you to Talking Galleries for hosting this and Mark for giving us such an interesting talk. Many, many thanks, Georgina and Mark, for this enlightening session. It has been a very interesting discussion with lots of ideas that are food for thought for many in our audiences. So thank you, thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you, and thank you to all our questioners. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I hope to see all of you in person at some time very soon. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Georgina. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.